Hi, Anne. Thanks for joining the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast today. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm excited. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. And but before we dive into the conversation, I just I have a, a little cadence of kicking off things with some positive words of affirmation. Um, so if that's your love language then from the caregiver jar. And I wanted to mention too, because I don't think I've mentioned this on the podcast, but the jars um, are, are available for sale with all these quotes and things. And there's like 150 different quotes and sayings that have been meaningful to me that I've put in. But I, um, it's funny because a lot of people I think are canning during the pandemic. So these <gasps> jars are hard to come yes. by. So there's also a PDF version where if people want to put it into their own container or, and it's a less expensive way too for people to get it because there's some manual labor involved in putting this together. <laughs> So anyway, anyway, so we've got, this is our wisdom today from the Happy Healthy Caregiver Jar. It says, never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Oh, I love that. I feel like we're learning a lot this year. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know I am. Yeah. I know I am. Yeah, definitely. Resilience. And, and yeah. I wrote this post about how to handle the grief overload of 2020 because even if you haven't lost somebody physically, it's just been, um, I was furloughed, we're doing empty nesting, uh, yeah. you know, you, obviously the isolation and not being on the hug people. And it's just like loss after loss after loss. And it's like, ah, I get it, I get it. So, um, so even the little things, you know, like I was walking by, uh, we live in this little community in Northwest DC um, with like elementary school, high school, middle school, like right in our neighborhood. And I was, um, I was walking the dog, you know, it's fall, right? And I walk past the elementary school and it's, there's, there's no children, you know, there's no like, laughter, you know, yeah. right. There's no fall fair or it's oh, just, mean. yeah, just everything. It's, um, there's a sense of just loss in general, I think. So even, nothing to compare to loss of, of family members and things like that, but just this, it's just a palpable sense of, of missing the the rhythms, you know, the rhythms of mm -hmm. our lives have been really disrupted, and that is that is psychologically really hard. So mm -hmm. anyway, well, I mean, I have to. I am impressed with people's creativity about how they're, you know, you know, we had that with Jacob's graduation and from high school, and we had to get creative with that and milestone birthdays, and you know, we're having a little dinner party um, yep. next weekend for my husband's 50th. And I'm like, okay, well, let's make it fancy and small, you know, instead of doing big, yeah. and, big and wild. So um, with prime rib and, you know, fancy disposable um, paper plates, but it's, uh, <laughs> so we've, we've had to get creative. And then I saw in a local town nearby where Halloween, they had just kind of this like self walk parade where they, it's Woodstock, Georgia, if people are local, um, and they had decorated all these costumes so that families could just like walk by these scarecrows and skeletons that were decked out as astronauts and movie stars and, and vampires. And I just thought that was super clever because, um, so right. I'm, I'm applauding people who are um, learning new things. And that kind of brings us back to that quote is never stop learning because life never stops teaching. And, you know, what have you tried that's been new since in COVID? Like what is it? Have you? Have you just oh. tried anything on as an activity or done yes. something different? Yeah, yes, yes. So, um, so for folks who are listening, my pre-COVID life was um, was pretty crazy. I I traveled all the time. I was always on planes and going to conferences, and you know, I think a lot of people are in that boat. Um, and so suddenly to be kind of grounded at my house. Um, I just really started to rediscover. I mean, I'm going to sound like the biggest cliche in the world right I now. like it. I'm going to sound like the biggest cliche, but I did rediscover my garden. And so, um, I, I basically have, this is a hobby of mine that I have loved my whole life and have completely neglected up until now. And so I've been, you know, I'm like in the dirt, you know, I, I've, I've got four, you know, uh, square foot gardens now in the side of my yard and I'm growing lots and I'm learning and I like erected my own, you know, chicken fences around them to keep the rabbits out. And it took me all day. And I was like, it's a good thing that, um, 
I fenced in my one salad that I'm going to grow this fall. <laughs> but it is really, um, it's been a really fun, it's therapy. Been, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. It's been very creative and sort of different. Yeah. So there are some silver linings and blessings in that. And we'd love to see a picture of your garden. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think, it, I think that's very cool. And I think it's probably something you can get the family involved in and you're eating, eating what you grow and, yeah. um, and that, yeah. all of that is amazing. So that might be something that I, uh, I try to tackle on in the, in the spring because um, I love eating fresh from, I mean, there's nothing like right now about all I have going is a basil plant, but it's still nice <laughs> to throw some basil in fresh basil and, and a salad yeah. or a little sauce. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, okay, I'm gourmet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, well, let's dive into it. Um, yeah. For those who don't know you, Anne, like tell us a little bit, uh, you know, give us, give us some information about your caregiving story. Sure. Yeah. So um, I have, like so many of you, I have a lot of caregiving stories because um, it's just really been kind of integral to the fabric of my family and uh, the most uh, kind of profound one was with my grandmother um, and uh, when I was much younger and um, uh, was fairly involved with her um, her decline in cognitive impairment and spent a bit of time um, sort of taking care of her on my own but then also um, I always like to joke about the trip that she, I, I drove her like part of the way across the country on her last ever trip and uh, with my grandfather. And that was very meaningful. And I really think actually that was when I was quite young and that was kind of the turning point for me in um, making this sort of, I just had this incredible heart sense of, I want to work on aging issues. I thought I was like, I'm going to be an environmentalist. Like that was like, I really was, I love the outdoors. I love, you know, and I was like, I'm going to go work for an environmental organization in Washington, DC. And I started helping my grandmother and then I was like, no, 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 I'm going to work on aging and health issues. And, and so that was kind of the beginning of my career. But, um, and then in my own family, uh, my dad has Parkinson's disease and yeah, I'm to protect his privacy. I won't talk too much about that, but he's doing great. He is doing great. Um, he's really amazing and total inspiration to me. So what kind um, of, um, caregiving responsibilities are you doing with your dad right now? Oh, really almost nothing to be completely honest. <laughs> I really, my mother, he is, he is, he's very independent and he's with my mom and my mom is on it. And she's sending me these hilarious texts about, I think my biggest involvement has been around the medical, trying to help navigate the medical care system mm -hmm. with them, like to make sure he's getting the right, you know, um, advice and, and sort of the best treatments and convincing him to do his therapy. And I, hilariously you know he's like stubborn and doesn't want to do it and so, yeah oh I know what that's like trying so, to tactics to um yeah so daughterhood know. oh sorry go ahead no go ahead go ahead I should say so daughterhood which is I found I, I found this organization daughterhood five years ago which I met you which is so this is that's one of the incredible benefits of having done that is this in community of, of women leaders around the country who've come together to help, uh, you know, create space for other people to, to get their needs met and to talk about their experiences. But, but my reason for starting it had less to do with my own personal caregiving journey than sort of what I was seeing in my friend group and my, and my family, I also have an aunt uh, who has really severe dementia. Mm. Um, and so just sort of being that go-to person for family members and friends because of my aging uh, work and research and knowledge of the healthcare system, then I just started to have this really profound sense that uh, I, that there is such a big difference between how things play out at the family level and the and the ground level and the kind of research and policy work that experts do and i really want to build a bridge like i was like i wanted to be able to share what i know with people like uh, my friends and family but i also want them to teach me and my colleagues mm -hmm. about what you know what it's what some of these decisions that you make you know at a policy level at a government level have on people's lives and, um, and so that's, I, I call it my field work in many respects, because mm -hmm. it's like, it's like really informative um, when I have a conversation with a policymaker or 
you know, a provider, you know, I can say like, this is, you know, you guys say you're doing it this way, but I talked to somebody and this is what happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Like just the other day in Washington, DC, I have a, there's a big skilled nursing facility organization that I've worked with. And then my neighbor had a stroke and was trying to get her mom, her mom had a stroke and she was trying to get her mom into the facility. And I ended up in, and I was like, you guys, what are you doing? This is terrible. Like, you know, so it's really interesting to see it at the ground level. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That, you know, it's, um, that you're, you, but you are building a bridge and it's n so needed because our healthcare system is very fragmented. Our government stuff is moving pretty slow. Um, the, the silver tsunami is a, is a real right. thing. Right. Um, and it's frightening. Uh, and I feel like they're kind of just getting started with some of the, some of the stuff. So, I mean, what are you hoping to see yeah. like, if you could, I mean, educating them and getting them informed, but well, yeah, what, what, what would just be like, oh, I, yeah. I don't do it, you know, you know? Yeah. I've been giving this a lot of thought, uh, just, just recently. And I think, um, because I do think COVID has set the stage for some really big change, particularly in how we take care of our older adults. And so, so what's exciting here in Washington DC is that like, like, I just feel I've been part of a lot of conversations now where like experts and you know, foundations and policy makers and stuff, and they're like, whoa, how do we do this differently? And and instead of just noodling around the edges and like, well, what if we pay for this over here, this over here, sort of like, what if we blew everything up? And I think that the one of the things that I've just come to the realization is like, and I don't know that my thoughts are all that well formed, so bear with me, but like yeah, you're good. You know how like like imagine if we had no educational system right now. Like if every single kid in the country had to be homeschooled, you know, you would like, like, you know, every family is its own island and it has to figure it out on their own. Like how are we gonna educate our kids? Like that would be crazy, right? That's what our aging system is. Like every family is an island. So there is no, we don't, you know, we have a postal system, we have an educational system, we have a, you know, we have all these like systems, but we do not have an aging system. So, that's and that's a good because, point. Yeah. And, you know, that's because you feel, you feel it. You feel, I mean, the pain points of caregiving are, yeah, isolation, overwhelm, you know, um, stress and anxiety. Yeah, all of that. And then you compound yeah. this pandemic on it, and it's just, it's too much. It's just too much, frankly. And, you know, I am encouraged. I work, you know, I work a day job as well. We had a, just got off a meeting earlier this morning where they were talking about what we can do to support our working moms. And I had took that as an education opportunity to say, look, it's not just the working moms. We've got these caregivers and, you know, people taking care of special needs kids and aging, like Im imagine that, you know, and you've got to feed them three meals a day. And, you know, and so brainstorming ideas of ways to help them. Now it's October. I wish those conversations would happen a little earlier in the year. But <laughs> it's it's better than nothing, right? And I think there are things like people, you know, employers could look at donating um, days off or, um, you know, getting discounts with services like Care.com or yeah, um, yeah, Bright Horizons or I don't know if you know any others, but it's just stuff yeah. like that. I think they're just they're it's it's a team effort. Yeah, what one hundred percent, and I think that um, I guess you know this is, you know I think I come from a somewhat I'm not going to get into politics at all because but I'll just say like I'm from the south, I was raised in a highly sort of religious environment, and I like you know I did work for Congressman John Lewis, so you know my my, my politics changed over time a little bit, but I would just say that like I think it's I think, and I am a small business owner. So, I mean, I am a, like, I, I deal with all the things that business owners deal with. And I think that, that like, I actually think that sometimes it really does make sense for certain things to be sort of a shared responsibility because it is inefficient. So I'm not talking about socialism. I'm just yeah. talking about like, it is not efficient for every family to invent its own aging system. <laughs> no, just, it's not scalable. It's 
it's not scalable. Yeah. It doesn't work. And we have all these incredible entrepreneurs out there right now, really creating new solutions to help with aging, particularly in technology. And they call, you know, I talk to them all the time and it's like, they can't, it'd be like trying to sell textbooks into if everybody was homeschooling, like we don't have a system you know, we like technology, people don't want to buy a piece of technology. It's just going to help them develop a better system inside their own family. What they really want is help, <laughs> you know, at, on a broader level. Yeah. So like coaching somebody, and understanding yeah. and validating them and connecting them to support groups and right. Uh, like, yeah. don't just, don't just like tell me how to do this better. Or help me do this better. Like, like there needs to be you know, uh, uh, like a much just like we need to have a better way to like when you start to go through this, that there is a place to go. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if on like in every community and there are area agencies on aging, but they're not well funded. People don't know about them. It's like, you know, what if, what if it was like this very clear process that you know or like system that you entered into where there was somebody to help you figure out where to start and how to go like i'm not saying that everything has to be paid for but just that there is an on-ramp yes. you know into the system anyway so that's so that's what i'm working on now is sort of like how if, if you're the federal government and you have this sort of economy that's struggling and you want to make some big investments in infrastructure um, you know, I'm sort of fighting for like, let's make aging part of that infrastructure that we fight, that we build. Like right. that's a great place. Well, to maybe repurpose out. some of the ones that aren't as efficient and useful anymore. Like right. you don't have to keep adding. There's probably some things we could subtract and have more value add where, exactly. um, so yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you've got a seat at that table and, and you're doing that. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I, I think back to when we, you know, you came down for the kickoff for the yes. daughterhood circle and we have the North, Northwest Atlanta is, is the daughterhood circle. I don't even know. Do you know how many daughterhood circles there are now? Yeah, there, we have about 25. Yes. Yeah. You were like our third, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and it was, wasn't hard to start. So if people are thinking about that, I mean, you and Susan, your sidekick have, you know, gave, gave some advice, but you didn't like should all over me, I call it, where you're just like, you should do this and that. And it was very, um, you know, we're here to support you. We've got some resources to help you. We can connect you with some other leaders and you can learn what they're doing. And I, I call mine kind of a social support circle because, you know, for many of these people, it's their only time away from their responsibilities. And so whether we were doing it virtually and we have started back to doing live um, in-person daughterhood circles based upon voting and seeing what people needed um, yeah. and it's in a safe way. Um, yeah. And, That's but great. there's usually some wine involved if people want that and some food, because, <laughs> you know, my hope is that they didn't have to cook dinner that night and they could, you know, get some, some yummy tasty right. morsel and, and we cry and we laugh. And, um, the, the first meeting you came to was great. And I remember, you know, I'm still working my day job and I was so frustrated. I wanted to take care for my mom and just help caregivers. And I feel like you had a crystal ball because I remember you vividly saying like, hang in there, Elizabeth, like 2020. And I was like, I can't wait till 2020. And there was years <laughs> involved in, um, and all of that. And you were like, this stuff is going to hit the fan. And, and like, here we are. And you didn't even wow. know about this pandemic. And right. I just, um, it, it, you know, and a lot of good stuff has happened and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what we have both accomplished in those, mm -hmm. in those years. Um, but tell us what's what's on the horizon for daughterhood. What are yeah. you proud of, and what you know? What have you some of the accomplishments yeah. that people might not know about daughterhood, and and what do you want? Where do you see it going? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so, um, you know, we we I would just say so for everybody's just to kind of level set here. I mean, daughterhood is. Um, really just a grassroots, I say just, but by, I mean that kind of like it is at its core, a grassroots movement where everybody who's involved, like at your level, and even people who just attend the meetings or whatever or all around the country are, are there because they feel really moved by this you know, the set of issues and the things that they've encountered and they feel kind of called to be part of the community. 
Um, and so we have grown organically, the, you know, the, the circles, the number of circles and the people in the circles and all that. And it's, and we don't have any funding. Like literally this is done all totally volunteer basis. Um, you know, we have a loose sort of board of directors, if you will, and the leaders, circle leaders, um, we get, as you know, we get together every so often and chat about what we can do to better serve the community. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, going forward, I, I'm a little bit at a crossroads because I don't really want, I really would like to be able to touch more lives. Like I would like there to be, I'd like it if we could have more circles and, um, uh, you know, uh, I'd love for there to be a circle in every community. I mean, that's really my vision is like, because again, because we don't have an aging system, you know, to me, this is the, what I call kind of the community health work that you're doing. I mean, you're really taking care of a community um, by connecting them to each other for social support, but also I was at your meeting when people were like, hey, do you know of a something? Can I get a, you know, where my mom's here, you know, adult day, like which this one's really good. I mean, like that. Like, what if we could, you know, setting the government and the government's role aside, which I, which I'm hoping to help um, bolster. But can we, as a, can we have in every community a, a group of caregivers who are the starting point, a place where we can enter into this experience with each other and get some help, practical help and emotional help. And so that's my vision. And I think what I struggle with a little bit is how to get from here to there without. Um, without any more funding. And that's, yeah. so I've been giving a lot of thought to that. I, you know, I think, um, not to get into details or stuff, but, you know, forming a 501c3, which I have not done yet, is a big undertaking. Yeah, I just see like paperwork. Like I know. And then do the paperwork. <laughs> so, yeah. I know. And then just like, it's like, then you have to like, uh, it's just have become, an official board of directors, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. an informal board with the with the leaders, and and we can help inform and steer things. But then you gotta like, there's a you've gotta. Then you become my boss. With. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's a lot to keep up with. Is that? It's just. And I'm I'm trying to just for every. I'm also trying to grow this other business, right? That that I'm hoping will be something that at some point in the future I can sell, and I've built some wealth for myself and my family, and so. It's just, um, it's, it's, there's just these, like everybody, like everybody, there's competing priorities. So, yeah. you know, that's not, I'm not complaining. That is a good problem to have. And I think um, it's something that we all struggle with. Mm -hmm. and you're really good at that. I think you're really good at sort of like setting priorities and decide how do you, not that this is my <laughs> interview, but how do you do that? Well, I mean, my kids are older now, so that, you know, and the caregiving responsibilities of they, as they've been more extracted from me being the primary caregiver to my sister, um, mm -hmm. and me being more of us in a long distance support and I, you know, an affectionate self-care bully for her. And, you know, I had more, more bandwidth, but it's really this, like, I can't not, not do it. Right. So it's, it's right a million right. times, but, you know, many times a month, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. You know, what am I doing? Let, let's, somebody else can, can handle this stuff. I'm just going to like go back to my day job and have, you know, serenity. Um, but it's, it's, a call, <laughs> you know, calling, uh, yeah. or whatever. so you just, you just keep, keep plugging along and then eventually, you know, you have a rough week and then you'll get some little note or, um, a podcast review or, a um, you'll hear something at daughterhood where like, I heard something from like, you know, you just never know like the things that you're going to say and like what, how they affect people. So I had written right. a story about my sister, Susie, in a day in her caregiving mm -hmm. life where I just kind of took this third party view and putting it all together. And somebody told me one of um, my coaching clients was like, you, that, that little piece of that article about setting the timer when mom was doing the nebulizer and my sister was having constant battles with her about fighting with her on keeping this breathing and she has COPD. It's a critical medicine for her to, to have gotten that. And so setting the timer for 10 minutes was keeping that on. And, you know, this changed this person's um, day completely, you know, because a nebulizer is something you usually have to use multiple times a day. And it's like 
four less arguments to have with somebody um, and you that, add, that adds up over time. And so I think that's the cool stuff that just kind of is. feeds me that, that little, it feeds my little hamster wheel. Um, and you know, I have a, I have a vision definitely for where I want to see things go. So, and daughterhood's a big part of that, of course, that's um, because as I kind of, you know, mom passed away in September and my caregiving kind of active caregiving, I guess, former caregiver technically now, although we still have my brother who's developmentally disabled and there's always kind of somebody right in the, yep, always. Um, always. but you yeah. know, it's, it's, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's good for me to have that access to fresh active caregivers as well as I kind of continue to not be in an active caregiving role. Daughterhood feeds that for me. First of all, it's been a huge support for me as well. I mean, I've shared many tears with them. They know my story. We, how's mom doing? We, you know, we, we share pictures and, um, and right. we're some of like, love my girlfriends to death, but they're just me be like done, done with the conversation. So. Right. Right. It's really hard if you're not going through it. And, uh, and uh, just to find those people that are that that get it is is the is the key. Um, so yeah, I mean you've been just I mean you. What I love about our community is that it really is just about we have somehow just attracted this incredible group of leaders that are. Um, you know, I mean I'm always really inspired when I talk to you all, and it's good. I loved coming to Atlanta. That was I wish I could get on a plane and. I know. Yeah. I, such a fun group of people. Yes, they are. They are fun and funny. Um, and <laughs> it's, I'm sure every daughterhood circle has a little bit of a different personality. Um, um, I would be, we would be remiss not to mention for the podcast listeners who like caregiving podcasts, since this only comes out every, you know, two weeks lately, it's been three weeks because I'm giving myself some grace here with the, with grieving and stuff. But, um, uh, Roseanne's podcast, um, the daughterhood podcast, and she's had some amazing guests on there, including Tifa Snow, um, for those with dementia, for dementia caregivers. And I love listening to her. So it's, there's, there can't be too many caregiving podcasts. We Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I just think when somebody feel, I, what I've noticed is that people like you, people like Roseanne are going through or have gone through this. Um, it is, I'm going to use this phrase, sort of spiritually redeeming and important for them to create meaning out of the experience. And so sharing like your talents in this context is a way of creating meaning and then having an impact on other people's lives. And so to me, that's just a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's so funny because Roseanne came and she's like, I really want to do a podcast and kind of, and I, and, um, you know, I, at first I was like, ah, uh, who are you? <laughs> and, then, and then Susan's like, no, trust me, she's great. She sent me this demo and she's great. And I was like, well, heck yeah. You know, it's like let universe. Yes. A thousand flowers bloom. And, you know, and then our, our San Diego leaders, Karen and um, Christine were like, we want to do video blogs. That was right before COVID. So that they, that's on the back burner right now. But, um, I was like, golly, this is cool. Like, what if it just gets back to that whole thing of like, when you let go, when you just sort of let things be what they are and try not to force them too much, just. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a parallel to caregiving, frankly, like. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is the biggest lesson really for me and caregiving is it's like learning how to let go. Like yeah. I cannot control this stuff is going to happen and it is out yeah. of control and it's just how you cope with it. And I have found more blessings that way through the business part of it, you know, is when I have kind of let go of what I thought, what I thought it should look like, um, and just be open to the possibilities because, um, I think you brought up a good point because there's probably women and, and men and who have caregivers listening out there who like, we all have, many of us are working, have worked or are working and, we have skills and your skills are transferable somehow in the aging and caregiving, caregiving industries, you right. know, whether you're in marketing, you know, you could help, you know, senior living facilities and, um, right. you know, these poor long-term care facilities that probably need some positive marketing and yeah, um, I know. <laughs> so, writing and, and finance, yeah. like there's all these things. And so using your experiences and your, 
in your professional skills, I think um, there, it can open up some doors. You know, I think people think like, oh my gosh, my, my skills are getting, you know, I'm, I'm focused on caregiving right now. And, and it's like, no, those are, those are amazing skills. Like you're learning how to be resilient, how to be um, yeah. patient, how to have compassion yeah. and, um, and lead and, uh, you know, acceptance and all of those things. Yeah. Uh, are, are transferable in any industry, frankly. Yeah, I always say, I was like, you know, but getting back to this whole, every family's an island and everybody's their own system, but you are like the CEO of the system. And so uh, even harder than CEO. You don't mm -hmm. call yourself a caregiver, you're president of- Institute. Yeah, so, exactly. Okay. You're, you're, running, uh, you're running an organization and it has all, and it's harder because of course your, your family members are in it, which is like, ah, so, but then also, you know, you got to think about like, what resources do I need? Who do I need to bring in? I think it's just, I, I think when people get some relief is when they make that, finally make that switch from like, just reacting to everything that's happening to sort of like, oh, okay, I get it. We're in this. Yeah. This is a thing. It's like, nobody told me about it, but now I understand it's a thing and I'm going to have to take charge and make some proactive decisions and recognize that like, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a, a trajectory to this that we're, you know, we need to prepare for over time. And that, I think when people make that switch in their minds that things get a little bit easier because they're not like, just, it's not just coming at them. No, I mean, it's the same, like you're saying, if you're a CEO president, like you, you're, you've got a lot of strong leaders underneath you and you're growing your team and you're expanding your, your corporation um, and growing those skills. And it's like, I know one of the things when my kids were younger and I was caregiving for mom, like someone had told me to, instead, you know, instead of being indispensable, you want to be dispensable, essentially like you're trying, right. you're, you're trying to get your kids to, um, be great humans and uh and so i didn't know like who they who their teachers were right or right. what their um grades were and such i would sit in groups with other moms and things and they would go did you and i'm like i have no idea like we had literally sat down like in project manage it in a way where my husband and i were you know lucky to have him first of all and he, you know he would take um morning stuff and i would take afternoon activities and kids like this is your job your job is going to school and you need to read these teacher blogs and you need to this because if you want to have any sense of family you know your parents are parsed out my husband was caring for his mom with lung cancer i had my mom with her cocktail of stuff and um if you want to be able to do anything fun and not see us doing laundry and cooking all the time you're gonna <laughs> have to pick, pick it up like and um they're, they're pretty good humans. I got to say. That's because really beautiful. That, that's so. really great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is very, very awesome. And I, but I think you're, you're homing in on something that is important, I think to emphasize, which is about setting priorities mm -hmm. and deciding like what's important to you. So like, if I think maybe it sounds like you guys may very much made this conscious decision. Like we, what's our family priority and our goal as a family is to have, to be able to have time together that isn't just about tasks. Right. And so if, if we're going to do that, then, then what that means is this, this, and this, and this. And so you yeah, were what needs to be true in order for that to happen. And right. then we did some things that might be questionable. Like people are probably listening like, well, whatever my kids, you know, stinks at school. They're never going to do that. Um, you know, I might, I might've gotten some good genes uh, in there too, but it's, we paid for grades like we did we looked at it as a job and we were like that's awesome and it's kind of controversial but i'm like if you get an a you get 20 or 25 bucks and then they you know that was 50 dollars a year per class kind of thing which we could afford and you know instead of honing out money this and that they earned money um you get nothing for a b and you have consequences for a c and that was kind of our our structure and it worked for us. And I don't, you know, like, like all of these things are going back to trying something new. It's like, you've got to kind of like test and pilot different things to see what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but that worked for us. And my kids were motivated by money. Maybe your kids aren't motivated by money, but oh, no. yeah, my kids are really motivated. By money. You know, they want those Lululemon <laughs> leggings and um, oh gosh, she's just stockpiling it for some grand thing. Some they're done, but now yeah. 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 But I do think, um, so hopefully maybe that would be, that's, that will help somebody out there. Um, so we've got to touch on self-care real quick. I want to know what does self-care look for, look like for you, um, Mm. right now? I really, so, you know, I have a certain perspective on this. So first of all, I just feel like, um, I have a very big personal struggle with self-care. And this is what I mean by that. Not that I don't care about myself, because I do. But just like, I, I'm an obsessive, compulsive person. So I know that to take good care of myself, I need to exercise. I need to, I need to, I personally need to, to <laughs> be somewhat disciplined about some habits that are good for me. Like, drinking my water, doing my exercise, getting enough sleep. Um, my problem is that it's very hard for me to do things uh, in a moderate way. So I tend to be an all or nothing. All or nothing. And then it's, and then it's too much, right? Then it's too much. And then, and then, and then I swing back over into the other side where like, I'm, you know, so, so I really, and so I feel like sometimes self-care for me feels like a tyranny <laughs> like it's like so sometimes for me self-care is not self-care so it's like just giving myself permission great to like yeah. like I'm not gonna be in great shape or I'm not gonna eat right today I I'm gonna like stay in bed till nine or like I'm not that person who's like up at five and doing my exercise I mean I have days like that and I feel awesome you know okay so last night I my husband and my son disappeared and it was like I was done with work I tend to work pretty late and then I was done with work and everything and I turned on the television and then I watched like four episodes of Emily in Paris which is supposedly not very good and it isn't but I just that's it violates every rule of like I didn't get to bed on time it wasn't good television I wasn't doing (laughs) It's okay. I have, I mean, since we're confessing, I sometimes I play a stupid um, game on my phone, Plants vs. Zombies. Like, I'm almost years <laughs> old, people. Like, why am I playing this game? But I mean, you're listening to your body, and it's kind of like, look, this is, this is what I need right now. And if you can set boundaries on it, you know, and Netflix helps you with that, right? Like, I love when that message comes up, like, yeah. are you still watching? Or, <laughs> you know, if you fall asleep, I'm like, and then you have to, like, okay, snap out of it. Like I need yeah. to, um, yeah. and yeah. I get you. And that's, it, I, I can sometimes be an all or nothing. And I love, I love a good process and I love to re-engineer a process and system. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and I have, I have had to learn over time. I think one thing that helped me with that self-care thing is mm-hmm. before it even started Happy Healthy Caregiver, I had an Instagram. Uh, I renamed my Instagram to Happy Healthy Caregiver, but I was inspired by somebody I saw who had like a hundred days of happy and they were posting just a picture a day. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be intentional about this self-care thing Mm -hmm. because I've seen what happens when you don't. I've got these parents at the time who frankly would still be with me had they not, had they, had they made, um, different choices, self-care. Yes. Different life choices. And my mother-in-law, well, you know, smoking was her cause of lung cancer. So um, I, I've, I've been surrounded by it and I'm like, okay, well that doesn't work. So you've got to kind of figure this out because you really like these people in your house and you want to be yeah. around. So, yeah. um, so I did started doing hundred days of healthy uh, hashtag and my, you know, my dad was sick and my mom was sick. It was like, that was just kind of all spiraling in 2014. And, and that's really what started me on, on making this kind of intentional, which oh, I see. Yeah. it could just be like, I'm going to drink water, you know, I'm going to really focus on my water today. Or I took my kid to a volleyball game and I got this like Moe's um, salad, you know, and this is self with avocado and there's some good stuff in here and I'm getting my bit. Like it, it was silly, stupid stuff, you know, like people think about self-care, like you, a pedicure in a girl's night out. Right, like, right. We need all that. We love that. But that's not real day to day. Real is, right. um, 
I'm just taking a shower. Uh, yeah, like, or a walk, you know, for me, like, I think I didn't realize how little I was moving once the pandemic started. And so just starting to move again and making time for moving and getting out and yeah, and sleep. Yeah. Like, I'm really enjoying right now because sleep was always kind of one of these things where it's like, I want to be a person who gets you know, how much sleep that they need. And I was sacrificing that to be that person who got up before work, before the pandemic and 5 a.m. and yeah. work out and shower and get to my desk by 8, 8.30 and just, you know, yeah. what was happening. And um, one of the silver linings for me has been just to not set my alarm in the morning. And when my body tells me to get up, I get up. I can pull my hair back and enjoy my cup of coffee without sitting yeah. in Atlanta traffic. And <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm loving all of that. And so I just, I think we got to be easier on ourselves when it comes to self-care and just like, you know, there is some good stuff in all these self-care articles. I love to read them. I love to pull out little nuggets, but I yeah. want to be like actionable and I don't want to shit all over people. I want to just, right, right, right. The end game is like, we want you around and happy and healthy. Well, and you know, I just, I will just put a quick plug in for brain health here. Cause I, we've been doing a lot of work in my, in my research job on brain health and they're really all of the things you're talking about really do have uh, long-term consequences for your cognition. And so cardiovascular health um, and good dietary habits and moving and sleeping are, are really important, important for the long haul. We are living a really long time and we are having but we haven't really compressed what I call that morbidity. So like we're living a longer, but that means we're having longer spells of being, you know, and needing care. And, and so if we just have to think in terms of like, I'm going to live till I'm 90, yeah. but I want the last 10 years to be quality that I got to do stuff now to make sure that that happens. And that's, and prioritize getting back to priorities and visions and yes goals. what that looks like i want to be my husband and i talk about like we want to like be able to write a check and like pick a place hopefully we can travel you know extensively in our um, I know. later years and i want to like live for a month in one place i love europe and then go see all of that and then the next year pick another place and research it in between and i can't do that if i can't walk without losing my breath and um, Are you oxygen or right. Yes. right like, right. no, I want to, I got stuff to do. And so, um, you know, hopefully there's some, you know, just think about your, your, you know, what's, what your dreams are. And maybe that's a good segue because some of these prompt types of things like that are in this just for, just for you daily self-care journal. And so I pulled some, some things out for you, but it gets people kind of thinking about this intentional self-care and, um, just in a daily prompt, like things that you used to do as like as a child and how could you mm -hmm. incorporate that into your daily life now? Like I love to ride my bike as a kid is a perfect example. Right. I don't get out and ride my bike too much because the tires need air and blah, blah, blah. But I have a Peloton bike and that's um, get feeding that um, thing and it, you know, energy and feeling less isolated. And mm -hmm. uh, so taking something that you liked and um, making it Thing. But anyway, and dreams and places you want to go and things you want to see. There's all kinds of things like that in here. So I marked a couple pages for you for our lightning round. And let's see what you've got to say about these things. Okay. <laughs> Fun. All right. So first question was, um, in your home right now, what are you doing to share the family responsibilities? With other people, you mean? Yeah. In your home. <laughs> like with yeah. your family. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. Um... Well, duh. <laughs> are you doing it all? Are you taking the trash out? Are you um, uh, be making the meals, going grocery shopping? Do you have help? With yeah, so we, we have, so my husband and I take turns every other week um, doing the grocery shopping. We used to, we were ordering groceries in, that gets very expensive. Mm -hmm. So now we, and we like to pick it out. So we, we each go each time to the grocery store. And then, um, you know, I think with, with my son, um, well, I just, I have spent an enormous amount of time making our, again, I'm a cliche, but making our yard and our back, our outdoor space around our house really enjoyable for the family. 
So we now have, you know, I mean, an outdoor fire pit. And so, and, and my kids are like, this is like, this is special. Like we really, but it's a lot of work. Like I'm out there, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort and energy. And so I feel like that's my big contribution. And then in terms of just the housework itself, I don't know, it's some, there's only three of us in the house right now. So it just, it just kind of gets done. That's good. That's good. Well, I'm glad to hear you're not doing it all yourself. That's good. No, no, I'm definitely not. <laughs> um, and I, this is probably a good one right now for this landscape where we're, you know, um, there's a lot going on in an election year, right? It's yeah. how could you prevent from being caught up in other people's problems? Ooh. Oh, oh, yeah. that's self-care really, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, you've only got so much joy and, you know, I always say, don't steal my joy. Like, look, I got, I need it all. I need it all that I got right here. You know what? I, this is the beauty of being 53. Um, oh, just, I mean, I just like, I, you know, the people who needed a lot, who like the, the, the drainers are just not part of my life anymore. They just, they yeah, just aren't, you yeah. know, we have too much to too much important work to do in the world. Like the way I started to look at it was when somebody takes something away from me, from my energy, then what that means is I can't give as much as I want to be able to give. So it's not about me. It's about sort of the, the larger ecosystem. Having said that, one of the things I have really been a lot more conscious about is, <clears throat> is really um, sort of my local, sort of, my, sort of like, I just used to work all the time. Like I would, I was just always at work or I was traveling or there was just no, very little interaction with my neighbors. And now my neighbors and I have this, like, it just feels like I'm much more, I'm making more time. So I'm letting, so I'm letting people into sort of my, my daily space that I didn't before, but also I have big boundaries around with people who were not adding to it. So it's really been a win. It's been a plus plus. Um, you know, the people who live, my, my next door neighbor, my across the street neighbor, my across the alley neighbor, like I've lived around these people for 25 years and just, we feel like we're more part of a community with each other than ever before yeah. because we're always home. So that's yeah. been the, like, that's been another silver lining for me. I love that. I've been definitely getting out more. We've got a new puppy. I'm yeah. A shout out to Sunny and Shadow who have been amazing during this podcast recording. Um, I'm probably going to pay for it later, but um, we just got Sunny on Monday. She's a little mini golden doodle. And I know I'm so jealous. I'm yeah. So, jealous. so, but uh, your, my sleep is, sa- is, uh, is, yeah, really, we did place yeah. it into a, a doggy trainer. So we're, we're <laughs> on top of it. Um, but I have, and you know, I, before we wrap up though, I want to, is there anything else that you wish we'd cover something you wanted to mention? Yeah, just really quickly. I just want to get back to the self-care thing again. I think that, um, everyone should give themselves credit, you especially for what I call other care. Um, and again, in a, in a way that is respectful of your own boundaries, but when you make it a priority to take care of others, you're, you know, you're contributing to their self-care. So, so just, I think it's just important to always kind of take a step back and feel gratitude for your own contributions to other people's well-being. And you, Elizabeth, uh, should absolutely, I just hope that you'll do that because you make a huge difference in the world. And I'm just so, I'm just so glad that we're friends and colleagues. And I just want to say thank you, most of all, for everything that you do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you as well. You've, you um, uh, connect us all to the advocacy part within daughterhood. And we got, like you said, we've got work to do and um, we're get, we are, it's, you know, it's working. I think, um, I think having that connection with you, I know we had a great spotlight in Washington post yeah. about our Atlanta daughterhood circle and having that kind of the connections that you have and um, making those connections with other people like, that's how we get the word out and that's how we start helping more and more people and um encouraging people to uh share their stories and get the the resources and support that they need so um it's a win-win-win here so i love it how do how do people best connect with you if they want to um learn more about your your the ati advisory well yeah so yeah so so many ways so you can sign up for the daughterhood newsletter can sign up 
for the ATI advisory. So it's atiadvisory.com, which if you're interested in policy and research and aging, you can sign up. If you're not, <laughs> boring, but you can sign up there. You can follow uh, me if you're a Twitter person. I'm not on Twitter as much as I should be. LinkedIn is more kind of my speed. LinkedIn and Facebook um, are the social channels that I'm most active in. Um, and uh, and like I almost I respond to almost every single email. Like if you enter a question into the daughterhood, um, sort of like contact me, or if you if you post a, a comment on a blog, Susan will flag it, send it to me, and we will respond. So we do a lot of um, just ad hoc, like like how do I get my mom out of the sniff? What do I do? Who yeah. do I call? We do a lot of that. So um, you know, we really welcome. I, we welcome out, you know, I, that's probably the very best way to get in touch. Daughterhood.org, contact us. And then yeah. if they're interested in, in setting up another circle, um, obviously they can see the circles that are out there. I'll link to that in the show notes. And then if they want to create their own circle, I know um, you and Susan will give the, the tools and resources they need. Exactly. Just, just, just like send it in through the, if there's a little place that says, I want to start a circle, you put in your information and, you know, and off it Why goes. Not? And Why not you, you know? Yeah. So that's exciting. I have enjoyed this time together. Me too. Um, I know we could talk for a long time and I'd much prefer to do it in person. And I know. And, but, um, and those yeah. will be coming. So. Um, we'll, look, we'll look back on this. I'll be like, oh, that wasn't so long or so bad. Yes. I hope your garden grows. Thank you. I look forward to um, uh, seeing what you're doing with all the, with the fruits of your labor there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll be, we'll be in touch. Thank you.